<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Belchick. Uh, I'm a senior water policy analyst, although uh, my training's in biology, and I work for the uh, Yurok tribe. I've worked for the Yurok tribe now for about 25 years, and uh, my job is as a water policy analyst is to work on the river flows and dam removal on the main stem Klamath. And where, where does my job come from? You know, what, what is it? So I work for the Yurok tribal government and everything we do in the Yurok tribal fisheries department stems from the culture and the values of the Yurok people. I'm not a tribal member, but I am an employee and I take it very seriously what we do. So the mission of the Yurok tribe is to exer exercise the Aboriginal and sovereign rights of the Yurok tribe of people to continue forever the tribal traditions of self-governance, cultural and spiritual preservation, stewardship of the lands, waters, and other natural endowments. I want to just point out that the stewardship, the value of taking care of things, is a central tenet of Yurok culture. I can't know exactly what it's like to be a Yurok tribal member, but I do take it seriously when I am taught and I learn about the stewardship mission of the Yurok tribe. So simply put, the job is to fix the river and the cultural landscape now and into the future for durable solutions. When we look at the problems on the Klamath, they're big. They're big problems. There's dams, there's a big water project. These are going to require landscape scale solutions and they're gonna require solutions that are integrated and oftentimes don't fit well into, let's say, an Endangered Species Act paradigm or things like that. So we're gonna talk about the water and fish today and I'm gonna start with the fish. Next slide, please. One of the differences between uh, tribes and tribal entities and other um, entities like uh, US Fish and Wildlife or different federal or state agencies is that the tribe sees the whole picture and they're concerned with all the species. You don't have to wait until a species gets uh, almost on the door of extinction for the tribe to be concerned about it. So when we look at like what we're look in, what's important on the river, um, I'm just, you know, this slide right here has all the uh, important fish and resources. So there's fall Chinook, spring Chinook, coho salmon, pink salmon, candlefish, chum, salmon, etc. I mean, you get the picture, mussels, uh, otters, regalia, uh, riparian vegetation, basket materials, all of it's important. It's not just what's on the endangered species list. But when you look at what's happening with the Klamath, next slide, you can see that there's trouble here. We've already lost some and I know there's a red X through candlefish, but we actually have a very small run that's uh, still there. But this is just sad. I mean, candlefish, Yulikon, uh, you know, were a staple. Uh, people would make candlefish camps down at the mouth of the river. Um, the Kapto and the Chuam are on extinction's doorstep right now. You know, the youngest ones you can find there are almost 30 years old. They're, they're about to go, and this is not okay. Um, if we keep going, next slide, please. We see in addition to the ones we've lost, uh, we're about to lose other ones. We, spring Chinook are hanging on by a thread in the Salmon River. Coho Salmon, Summer Steelhead. Uh, all What we're seeing here is that things are in trouble. And if it's like trying to solve a case here, like, all right, we see that a murder has been committed. What, what, what happened? Next slide, please. And we can start to see, if we start to see what's happened to the landscape, we start to see what's happened to the river here. And so one of the questions I deal with in my work all the time here is, how much water does a river need to live? And I think, you know, Indian people know, and I know, the answer is pretty simple to that, actually. You don't need a big multi-million dollar flow study to understand that in order for the river to truly be itself, it needs all the water, all of it. The natural, the natural flow paradigm, 
uh, and even Western science is finally catching up with this, with this idea here. And so when you start looking at like all of these flow studies that are done, whether it's, uh, you know, ones that the Yurok tribe has participated in, all, what they're trying to answer is how much water can be taken out of the river. And that's a question uh, that even just trying to answer it is dangerous because you're already acknowledging that some can be taken out. But this dam that we're looking at in this picture here is pretty interesting. This is Link River Dam and it's out the outflow for Upper Klamath Lake. Now Upper Klamath Lake used to flow out of that area right there just fine without a dam. There was a big rock reef in there. And of course, uh, you know, white folks had to come along and blast it out of the way and put a dam in. And now that that's there, there's, you got to manage it somehow. And the Kupta and the Schwam need the lake to be at certain levels upriver. And uh, working for the York tribe, we've always respected that. I actually used to work on Kupta and Schwam, and I lived in Chiliquin for a while. I have worked with the Klamath tribes uh, back in the past. But so now the question is become thrust upon us. How much water does a river need to live? Next slide. Well, it needs more than what was given to it in 2002. This is a picture I took myself. And when I'm right at the mouth of Blue Creek looking up river, Blue Creek is emptying into the river just upstream from there. And I, um, it's, it's hard for me to even look at this picture. Um, so this is what's at stake here. We, we talk a lot about water and acre feet and the flow that the river needs and everything. And it's good to take a look at this picture every now and then remind yourself, this is what's at stake. This is what happens when you don't give a river enough water for it to live here. And so when we talk about like, well, what does it take to get water in here? The fact is, even though the Endangered Species Act isn't what really should rule the river, what really should govern river flows is how much water is necessary for the river to be itself and to fulfill the rights of the indigenous tribes on the river. Uh, that's what the true question could be, but oftentimes you gotta deal with the hand you dealt. So how does it happen? How does a change happen? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, um, sorry about that. So what, so first of all, um, can we go back one? I'm sorry. I, I, uh, so when we talk about like what must be done, can we go back one slide, Regina, please? We're um, skipping I, to how does it happen. I actually <laughs> don't, oh, oh, hold on. Here we go. I think I can. Yep. That's right. I could talk us through it. So we talk about what must be done. Um, one of the reasons um, I feel, um, one of the reasons I've stayed with the Yurok tribe and I feel like I'm doing good for the river is the Yurok tribe has never been afraid to think big, to think about what it really takes to solve the problem here. And so with things like dam removal, when the Karuk tribe, Hoopa and Yurok tribe started talking about removing the dams on the Klamath River. Nobody else was. We were the first ones to talk about it. We bring the salmon home. I think the other thing about dam removal is that we unite the basin, both with the salmon, but also culturally, uh, both for uh, indigenous people, the Klamath tribes, Yurok tribe, Karuk tribe, but also uh, for other folks too, farmers, uh, fishermen in the ocean, things like that. Uh, the salmon are the integrator. They bring the upper and lower basin together. We need the right flows on the Shasta, Scott, Trinity, and Klamath. If you give the right amount of flows, if you give adequate flows to support uh, the fishery, it doesn't automatically fix the fish. They need more than that. But the converse is that if you don't have the right flows, if you don't have enough water in the river, then no matter what projects you build, what fisheries habitat projects, you import some wood in there, you do all the right things. It's not gonna work if you don't have the right base flows in the river. The other problems we have are to fix the water quality. Uh, we need to, it was gonna say restore fisheries habitat. Restore fisheries habitat, 
The Sprague and the Williamson right now are in dire shape, as are the Shasta and Scott Rivers. And we also need to restore the wetlands, large scale wetland restoration in the Upper Klamath Basin. Next slide. And we talk about how to make that happen. So I'm, I'm talking with uh, people who are interested in protecting the river, water protectors, people who want to restore, people who want to integrate uh, tribal values into society here. And so how does it happen to make the change happen? Uh, that's what I've been working on my whole career. It starts with culture. It starts with integrating traditional environmental knowledge and science. I, and I'm telling you, as, as a, a non-tribal member working on this, the science oftentimes um, verifies what traditional environmental knowledge knew all along. We, I see a convergence over and over again. Example, spring Chinook and fall Chinook and Western science just finding the gene that, that distinguishes the two, but traditional environmental knowledge knew those were different all along. That's uh, an example there. But in, to make things happen against the, um, the machine that's in place now, and even, uh, you know, the Trump administration's bad, but I worked through Democrat administrations that they weren't much better, to be honest. Um, it takes everything. You need litigation. You need direct action. You need to be thinking about media, politics, policy. You need to organize. The message I'm trying to get is that you need every tool in the toolbox in there. You, one thing or another won't get it done. And that picture right there, that's from when the tribes went to Scotland, and this is in front of the Pacific or where it was Scottish Power shareholder meeting in downtown Edinburgh, Scotland, when the tribes took the fight across the ocean to Scottish Power because Scottish Power owned the dams on the climate. They owned Pacific Ore at the time. And I just put this up as an example of what it takes sometimes to get people to listen to you. Next slide. So one of the big issues we're doing is dam removal. And so uh, right now we're working through as our people on the Jordan Co pipeline on through the FERC issues. So the dam removal deal right now has a nonprofit organization that has been created. Pacific Core is providing $200 million through a rate payer surcharge. State of California is kicking in $250 more million through a water bond. Um, and then we're waiting for FERC approval to transfer the dams to this uh, company, to the Klamath River Renewal Corporation. Everything's been done. The uh, Klamath River Renewal Corporation has Kiwit International, one of the largest construction companies in the world on project. We have engineering drawings done to 90% spec, plans drawn up on exactly how to take the dams down, contractors ready to work, environmental documentation done, clean water quality permits done, applications submitted to FERC, um, letters of support even from the company saying, please decide. Um, so, and FERC will not act. And I will say that, um, the studies that have been done for uh, regarding dam removal, as far as um, as far as the downsides and the upsides are extensive. There are tens of thousands of pages, and so right now the company has decided there's an upside to removing the dams. They want out. They've signed the agreement to take them out. We've looked through all the environmental uh, things. Next slide, please. And this is one of the next slide shows one of the environmental. This is toxic algae right here. Uh, and uh, there's a whole number of temperature effects and uh, I'm not gonna go into all of that. Uh, next slide. The potential to be gained is over 400 miles of anadromous fish habitat. But that's not enough. We need to, we need to do more than that. So one of the other challenges is water quality. Next slide. And what we see as a solution to that is large scale wetland restoration. And this is a picture of Upper Klamath Lake showing the Wokus marshes and, and Mount Scott uh, near Crater Lake in the background. But this is the way you can clean water. This is what it takes to 
get the uh, nutrient laden water out of Upper Klamath Lake to stop affecting the the water quality downriver so much. I want to finish. I'm on my second to last slide. Next slide will be the second to last slide. Um, I want to talk about durable solutions and what it and some of my observations over a couple of decades. Uh, when we talk about uh, the mission of the Yurok tribe, it has a time element to it. It needs to be durable. It needs to preserve the river for the future. And so we need clear thinking required for long-term solutions. The way forward is not always obvious. Oftentimes tribes are faced with two choices. You can either fight it, like why don't we just go to court, for example, you hear that a lot. Or sometimes uh, it's worth talking with people and trying to figure out if there's a solution that could work out for everybody. It's not always obvious and sometimes you have no choice. Sometimes you're forced into litigation. You have to fight for what you're right is. And I'll give us an example. Right now, the water flows depend almost entirely on the Endangered Species Act. Is that the best way to ensure flows when we move forward? Um, is that durable? What's gonna happen in 20 years? What if the ESA is overturned? What if coho are not listed anymore, um, et cetera? So what's really protecting the water right? To me, it feels like the Endangered Species Act is a thread and it's bearing the entire weight of the lower river flows. When in fact, there's tribal rights. There's an important fishery. There's economic might to the fishery downriver also. Like look at all the ports up and down the West Coast. And another thing that I've seen, uh, especially lately, is how can tribal rights become more of a guiding factor in the flow and water management decisions? And I will just observe, and every tribal member knows this, that rights are never granted, they must be asserted. And so when you look at the Klamath tribes, you know, they made a decision in the early 1970s to assert their right, to go for the water right. And right now they're in the final stages, decades later of winning. And so sometimes you have to do that. And these are the questions right now that the Yurok tribe are looking at right now. We're looking at the ESA um, and um, other, other options like that and seeing a future where that doesn't look so secure. So I think right now it's safe to say that the Yurok tribe is thinking through a lot of its options. Uh, we have uh, I see there was a question about granting the river living rights. Uh, the Iraq tribe has taken steps to do that. It's not clear whether that's going to provide traction with the US courts or law or anything like that. But I think the bigger point though, is that we go back to how to get it done. Um, when we look at say the campaign for dam removal, it took media, I think direct action had a huge impact on uh, how the company was thinking about the dams. It took, we had to win litigation against Pacific Corps. Uh, it took everything we had to develop the right science. Uh, we had to get tribal members interested in directed, direct action. It took everything. And I think that's what it's gonna take moving forward to get these landscape scale solutions to work in this basin. And I did see some questions as I was talking. That's last slide, please. Um, that, I think uh, we will have time for a question and answer, and I want to make sure to give the other panelists time. Is that right, Regina? Yeah, there'll be question and answer at the end. So okay, so because I saw some really good questions, but I'm at the end of my time. So I'll answer some questions, hold on to them, we'll talk about them in, in a little bit, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Mike, and um, thank you so much to the Yurok Tribe for all you do for the rivers. Um, with that, now I'd like to introduce Tom Stokely, who's with the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations in Save California Salmon, and he's going to present on the Trinity River, which is the Klamath's largest tributary. Thank you, Regina. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm with Save California Salmon. I work with PCFFA. I'm also with California Water Impact Network. Uh, the Trinity River is the largest tributary of the Klamath River, and the two rivers share the lower 44 miles before entering the Pacific Ocean. The Trinity is in a very unique position of being a natural Klamath River tributary, but it's also a tributary of Clear Creek, the Sacramento River, and according to state law, it's considered a 
delta tributary watershed. So it's really right in the middle of things. Oh, I need to give my PowerPoint here. Hang on. No, that's not it. There we go. Okay. So that's Trinity Dam, it's quite large. Uh, this is a, uh, a view of the Trinity River Division of the Central Valley Project. You can see Trinity Dam, Lewiston Dam, what's now called the Clear Creek Tunnel, Whiskey Town Reservoir and the Spring Creek Tunnel that takes it into Keswick Reservoir and the Sacramento River. Despite hydraulic mining, unregulated logging, overfishing, and other impacts, the Trinity River has historically produced large numbers of salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, lamprey, and other species. However, an act of Congress in 1955 authorized the Trinity River Division of the Central Valley Project, otherwise known as the turd of the CVP. We'll call it the Trinity River Division. It consists, again, of Trinity Lewiston and Whiskeytown Dams associated tunnels, including, again, the 10-mile Clear Creek Tunnel, which takes essentially Trinity River water from the Klamath Trinity Basin into the Sacramento Basin. The fishery has steadily declined since the dams were completed in 1963, despite a congressional requirement to do no harm, which is up here in the upper left-hand side, or upper right-hand side of that uh, slide there. There are numerous laws, regulations, and legal authorities that require the Trinity River's fisheries to be protected in order to meet tribal trust obligations to the Hoopa Valley and Yurok tribes, as well as the California Public Trust, the Clean Water Act, and other le legal obligations. The 2000 Trinity River Record of Decision substantially increased Trinity River in-stream flows, and I don't have time to go into all those laws and requirements now, but suffice to say that the fishery has not been adequately protected and has been in serious decline for decades. The waters of the Trinity River are extremely valuable, perhaps the most valuable water per acre foot or per gallon than any other water source in California. The Trinity River Division produces large amounts of hydropower because of the difference in elevation between Trinity Lake and the Sacramento River and the four power plants that are in between. The Trinity River was specifically dammed to provide water to the powerful Westlands Water District in Fresno, whose lobbyist David Bernhardt is now the Interior Secretary, and therefore the waters and fish of the Trinity River are constantly under threat. The Bureau of Reclamation has contracted for far more water than exists in reality, so the Trinity River is a, another victim of what we call uh, paper water whereby the demands are always greater than the supply and there's never enough water for all. And here are some of the major threats to the Trinity River. Here's a nice picture of Trinity Dam and Reservoir, perhaps if you're on magic mushrooms uh, anyway. Uh, the uh, cold water in Trinity Lake, it was, uh, Trinity Dam was built in the early 1960s. At the time, it was the largest earth fill dam on earth. That's about 500 vertical feet there. Uh, during periods of drought, Trinity Lake water levels will continue to decline year after year, and ultimately Trinity Lake will run out of water sometime in the future because there is no legally binding minimum storage requirement. When the reservoir gets down to about 36% of capacity, which is about 900,000 acre feet out of two and a half million acre feet. Uh, there's not enough water to keep the fish in good condition below the dams, especially if the cold water runs out early in the summer. Here's a, another picture of Trinity Dam just as it was built. Uh, you can see the uh, landslide on the uh, left abutment there that's still active. Obviously things have grown out a little bit more uh, since then. Here's a picture of Trinity Dam before they filled it in the early 1960s. Uh, Trinity Dam's power plant outlet is about 100 feet higher than the auxiliary outlet on the bottom of the dam, which is down in here. If the power plant, actually I've got a pointer here. Oh yeah. 
So I think the auxiliary outlet is in here. I'm not sure where the power in inlet is, but it's a hundred foot difference between the two. If the power plant bypass is not bypassed, starting at around 900,000 acre feet of storage, uh, warm water from the upper layers of the reservoir will discharge uh, into the river such that it will harm the downstream fish. Uh, to give you an idea of the magnitude of the size of this dam, I want you to look at the glory hole spillway in the upper left-hand corner, that little donut looking thing there, and now look at the next slide. That's the glory hole there. I think that's about 30 feet in diameter. I'm not uh, completely sure, but it will pass 24,000 cubic feet per second when it's full. Um, the Clear Creek Tunnel, which moves water to the Sacramento River, is 17 and a half feet in diameter, and it's big enough to drive a Jeep in. Uh, this is a picture, maybe taken by Mike Belchick, I'm not sure, but this is a picture of the Klamath River uh, fish kill that he talked about. Um, I use it as an example of what happened to the Trinity River in 1977. Uh, the Bureau did not bypass the power plant and hundreds of thousands of young salmon and steelhead died at the hatchery from warm water diseases such as polymeris. We don't really know what happened in the river that year, but surely it was not good, especially for the spring Chinook that we're holding in the river. These were similar conditions to those found in 2002 in the lower climate fish kill, uh, again, with just the photograph above. Power plant bypasses mean lost hydropower production and therefore less power produ is produced and less money is made. So it's not popular with the Bureau of Reclamation and its water and power contractors, but it is necessary at times to save the fish from getting cooked. Various current and proposed projects, uh, such as uh, the increased water deliveries to CBP contractors under the Trump Water Plan, the Westlands Permanent Water Contract, Sites Reservoir, Delta Tunnel, they're all projects that will lead to accelerated demands on the Trinity River and increase the frequency uh, of cold water running out in Trinity Lake during extended drought. Uh, these projects can also change the timing of water diversions from the Trinity River to the Sacramento River, uh, thereby causing warming of the water in Lewiston Reservoir because there's not enough water moving through it and that can heat up the Trinity River even if there's enough water in the river. And this is particularly critical during the summer when the spring Chinook are holding in the river and during the fall when the uh, <clears throat> fish are spawning. Uh oh. Well, there we go. Hang on. Okay, the next threat is Sykes Reservoir. It's a proposed off stream reservoir west of Maxwell. You can see Trinity Lake is up here. Here's the diversion essentially, uh, the water from the Trinity River and Trinity Lake could be used to fill Sites Reservoir. Uh, Save California Salmon had our hydrologist, Greg Kamen, review the 2017 draft environmental impact statement and report, and he found very significant impacts to the Trinity River, despite assurances that there would be no harm to the Trinity River. Uh, this includes the modeling did not include Humboldt County's 50,000 acre foot contract or the Lower Klamath record of decision that's there to prevent another fish kill in the Lower Klamath. It changes, changed the timing of diversions from the Sacramento River uh, from fall months to winter and spring, which would increase the temperatures during the fall spawning period. Uh, there's a decrease in Trinity River flows in the winter and not related to the Trinity, but still of importance is that the minimum 5,000 cubic foot per second bypass in the Sacramento River would have very uh, signif significant negative impacts to the Sacramento River. Okay. Uh, Save California Salmon did lead an effort to request a recirculated draft EIS EIR for the sites project in 2019. And while they're not doing it because of us, they are reissuing a supplemental draft EIS EIR next year. And we are hopeful that the impacts to the Trinity River will be eliminated, but I'm very skeptical. Uh, Humboldt County has specific, submitted specific language to the sites project authority for the project in order to eliminate Trinity River impacts, but so far there has not been a positive response. Uh, we will continue to have our experts review and comment on the supplemental document next year, 
Uh, if we don't like what we find, there are several administrative actions that can be taken. Uh, the next is the Trump water plan, uh, the so-called uh, new biological opinion, <clears throat> otherwise known as reinitiation of consultation for long-term operation of the state water project and the Central Valley project. Uh, historically, Trinity Lake has not been drained to a mud puddle because of limits on the Bureau of Reclamation's pumping uh, from the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta in order to protect endangered species in the Delta salmon and Delta smelt. Uh, the Trump administration has undone that regulatory protection through their new operating plan and biological opinion. Uh, we had our hydrologist, again, Greg Kamen, look into the new operations plan and he found that the Bureau of Reclamation performed inaccurate uh, modeling that actually uh, over predicted storage in Trinity Lake to the point that during the next multi-year drought, uh, we could see Trinity Lake 350,000 acre feet lower than the Bureau says it's going to be. Uh, and that basically means that the fish will start to die in the Trinity River sooner than they predicted. The Bureau of Reclamation is also, oops, in the process of uh, taking 86 interim Central Valley Project water contracts and turning them into permanent water contracts. And um, the biggest one is, of course, Westlands, but there are others. And uh, I won't go into, into all the specific impacts of those particular contracts, but suffice to say that it will ultimately increase demands on the Trinity River, decrease the amount of cold water storage in Trinity Lake, especially during extended drought. Uh, one of the ways that could happen is if some of this agricultural water is transferred to municipal and industrial uses and they get different cutbacks during drought. So again, that would increase demands on the Trinity River. Uh, the Delta Tunnels Project is proposed to allow greater deliveries of both Central Valley Project and State Water Project. Uh, water from north of the Delta at Clarksburg on the Sacramento River and send it down to the state pumps at the Southern Delta instead of having the water go down the Sacramento River and then go back upstream on the San Joaquin River. Uh, again, this project will likely uh, lead to increased demands on Trinity River and Trinity Lake water, and uh, especially during severe drought. I'm reasonably certain that we will be able to stop the latest version of this project, but there's never an assurance it won't come back uh, to haunt us like a killer zombie like it has for the last uh, 40 years. Uh, I've been working to fight this project for the last 10 years, and I'm proud of the fact that we killed the Twin Tunnels projects, and we will continue to participate in the process. Uh, in summary, we have two options. One is the one on the left uh, when we run out of water for fish, and the other is the one on the right when we have healthy uh, species, all the ones that Mike Belchick uh, talked about. The Trinity River is already at risk of running out of cold water. Each successive decision and project and almond tree that's planted increases the ability and demand to deliver more Central Valley Project water south uh, from the Trinity River and change the timing of diversions. This increases the risk to the Trinity River that the salmon and steelhead will essentially be cooked by warm water releases from Trinity and Lewiston dams. While there are multiple rules, regulations, administrative decisions, legal decisions and the tribal trust that say the Trinity must be protected. There are multiple threats to make it even worse than it is today. Uh, we will continue to work on to protect and restore the Trinity River. And uh, I wanted to just thank the water protectors out there. Thank you for your efforts. Uh, I very much appreciated and admired your work at the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors on Sites Reservoir and the Delta Tunnel Scoping Hearings. You are making a difference. Uh, you're the future of the Klamath and Trinity Rivers. Um, I've been doing this for 37 years, and I think it's time for some young talent uh, to take over. And let us not forget that the original Trinity River Task Force that was formed in the early 1970s was a result of a Trinity High School class in maybe 1970, <coughs> excuse me, 73 or 74, that held a salmon funeral uh, on the Trinity River and it gained national attention and it started the restoration efforts that continue to this day. Thank you.